or so. And um, uh, first of all, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining this evening. I really appreciate it. I think it'll be a lot of fun and educational uh, for us. So uh, uh, first of all, let me introduce myself to those of you I don't already know. My name is Jerry Moy. I'm from the CCNY City College of New York class of 1972. And uh, currently I'm on the board of directors for the Asian alumni group. And um, just a few words about the Asian alumni group. It's uh, actually our 40th anniversary, believe it or not. Uh, we were uh, created back in 1981 uh, to promote networking among Asian American students, uh, alumni and faculty. And in the past four decades, we've grown a little bit further to uh, educate and promote awareness of Asian American issues, interests and culture. So uh, the organization keeps on changing. And uh, unfortunately, what we've seen over the past year is a lot of things are not going so well. There's been an alarming increase in anti-Asian rhetoric, uh, a la the Chinese flu, Kung flu, and so forth. And now more recently, just outright attacks against uh, Asian Americans. It's becoming, unfortunately, a, a regular item on the six o'clock news uh, to hear about the latest anti-Asian incident. Uh, so there's a lot to unpack there, and I'm not gonna go into the issues now, but yeah. suffice it to say, this is a serious issue and situation that requires our attention and focus. And whether you're an Asian American or not, you know, we need to look at this and pay attention. All right. Uh, the other elephant in the room has obviously been the coronavirus and how it's impacted all our work lives and our personal lives. And um, our, uh, in a little while, our guest speaker this evening, Grace Young, will be talking about how the pandemic has affected Chinatown uh, uh, small businesses. So that should will be a very interesting uh, discussion. But let me get to the agenda for the evening. Uh, we're going to have some fun and we're going to learn some things from uh, award-winning cookbook author Grace Young. Uh, Grace will also demonstrate uh, to us how to prepare longevity noodles and talk about her work supporting Chinatown businesses devastated by the pandemic. Uh, there will also be a Q&A session. So start thinking about questions that you might have and just uh, jot them down into the chat box and we'll uh, address them as, as many as we can uh, when we get to that point. Um, also in the next hour, we're gonna be uh, conducting two raffles uh, and, and many of you will win autographed copies of Grace's uh, cookbooks and uh, some uh, carbon, genuine carbon steel walk sets and Grace will talk a little bit more about why carbon steel and so forth. All right. So let, let's uh, try to get things rolling a little bit. And um, let me say that uh, last, uh, one of the activities of uh, the Asian alumni group uh, has been that every year we recognize an outstanding Asian American organization and uh, individuals. Last year, we recognized as the 2020 Asian role model, retired federal judge, uh, immigration judge, uh, an acclaimed amateur cook, a CCMY alumni and my old friend, George Chu, who's on here right now. And George has uh, kindly agreed to introduce Grace, uh, his friend Grace to us. Uh, I think uh, they share this uh, heritage of knowing how, how to cook. And I think that's an important uh, uh, background for all of us to have. So George, if I may, I, I would like to turn it over to you so that you can uh, do a few minutes of introduction. Thank you. Okay. Um Hi, everybody. Uh, Grace is uh, one of the most celebrated Chinese cookbook authors in America. She has been called the stir fry guru by the New York Times and a walk evangelist by others. She has received so many accolades, it's difficult to begin to list them, so I won't. Uh, you can check out her accomplishments on her website, graceyoung.com. I first met Grace sometime in 2008 when I introduced myself to her at one of her talks, I was a fanboy because I had read her two cookbooks, Wisdom of the Chinese Kitchen and Breath of a Walk. Uh, I was very impressed by her writing, her passion for her family, and the respect for culinary, Chinese culinary traditions. Uh, wisdom is an homage to her parents and uh, relatives. It is a food memoir of the Chinese immigrant experience of how her parents immigrated to the US and raised two children. It is a story of love, perseverance, and triumph told through food. It features classic 
Cantonese home cooked dishes. Uh, Breath is a tour de force study of the wok in Chinese culture. Uh, she explains the meaning of <clears throat> wok hei, the ephemeral taste of food properly prepared in a hot wok. Uh, she's traveled to Hong Kong and China, interviewing and speaking to home and restaurant cooks. She even tracked down artisans who made hand hammered walks in the streets of China. She's personally trying to reverse the trend of home cooks who use Western skillets to cook Chinese food. It is the consummate <clears throat> book on uh, wok cooking. Uh, she certainly earns the moniker wok evangelist. Her last book, uh, Stir Frying to the Sky's Edge, explores the Chinese diaspora and how the Chinese adapted to their surroundings and incorporated local ingredients in stir frying local versions of Chinese food. Uh, the book features recipes from all over the world and the United States. It is my favorite of her three books because it features four of my recipes, but I digress. Uh, all three of her books have won multiple awards. Uh, I hope you have all entered the raffle because you have an opportunity to win one of the books autographed by Grace. <clears throat> uh, since January 2020, as the pandemic ravaged the country, Chinatowns throughout the country were devastated. Longtime businesses and restaurants closed. Chinatown in New York was hit particularly hard. Grace has taken it upon herself to help China, Chinatown businesses survive. She initiated the Support Chinatown Fund in conjunction with the community organization, Welcome to Chinatown. Her goal was to raise 20,000 for four legacy restaurants so they, that they could provide hot meals for low income, the food insecure and seniors. So far, she's raised over $34,000. She has also partnered with the James Beard Foundation to start the Save Chinese Restaurant Initiative to help Chinese restaurants around the country survive. Every time there's a radio or television program about Chinatown, she's on it, preaching her message to support Chinatown businesses. You can find a list and link of the programs that she has appeared on her website, graceyoung.com. Without further ado, it is my honor to turn the show over to the incomparable Grace Young. Thank you very much, George. And um, thank you for that beautiful introduction. And I want to wish everybody a happy year of the ox. Um, I've been doing Zoom lunar cooking demos for the last couple of weeks, and they have slowly evolved. Uh, at the beginning, some of the cooking demos I did were a week before the Lunar New Year. So I yes. covered everything that traditional Chinese families need to do, cleaning their house a month before to make sure that- It's knocked uh, me off the screen. Can you hear me? Yes. Is everything okay? Sorry. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Can I continue? Yes. Y yes. Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, at the start, it was all about all the Chinese traditions uh, to ensure your good fortune and blessings for the coming year, um, from getting your hair cut before Chinese New Year's to not using a knife on Chinese New Year's Day or sweeping away your fortunes by using the broom on the first day of the New Year. But now it's uh, way past the Chinese New Year. And uh, since this still is your Lunar New Year event, I thought I would just touch upon something that all of us can do moving forward. And that is one of the traditions connected with the Lunar New Year is the kitchen god. And I believe I have probably the largest collection of kitchen gods in America, possibly in the world, because I've been collecting them for over 20 years. And it's uh, one of the things, I love old traditions. And uh, in the old days, every Chinese home, every Chinese kitchen had a kitchen god. Uh, today, when you go to Hong Kong or China, most restaurant kitchens always have a kitchen god because it ensures that your cooking is delicious and it prevents kitchen accidents. So when I first heard about the kitchen god, maybe it was through Amy Tan's book, and I went to Chinatown and I went in search of a statue, but I couldn't find one. Uh, the most common kitchen god is actually this plaque. 
and it's generally painted in red. And it has the four Chinese characters, Ding Fuk Zhou Guan in Cantonese. Can you see that? There. Um, so that means actually the, the best translation is determiner of good fortune. And so most restaurant kitchens and households have this plaque. I actually have the incense burner right in front of it. Um, my mentor, Florence Lin, who was a very famous Chinese cooking teacher uh, who died a few years ago, gave me this kitchen god, which is the picture. And if you can see that. And if you've had a particularly bad year, uh, the Chinese will actually, uh, the old fashioned Chinese would actually just throw away the picture at the end of the year. So for sure, after last year, <laughs> I think <laughs> people want other <laughs> pictures. And then here come the statues. This is only a small selection of the statues that I have, but um, I, on many, many trips to Hong Kong yeah. and China, I went in search of the statues. So the statues are very, very hard to find. Um, hmm. I even have a modern gold statue. Um, I have more in another room. But, but what I love about the kitchen god is uh, the Chinese always put the kitchen god above the stove or to the side of the stove because the meaning is that the center of your home is the, the kitchen. And so therefore he can watch and observe everything that you do throughout the year. And uh, the main connection at Chinese New Year's is one week before the Lunar New Year, you need to bribe the kitchen god. So you either give him alcohol so that when he ascends to the heavens to report to the Jade Emperor, um, he is so drunk and his words are so slurred that whatever he reports that's bad about you, the Jade Emperor can't even understand. Or you can offer him fruits. It's very typical to offer him sweet oranges or tangerines to sweeten his words. And um, so there are many domestic gods in Chinese culture. And I just love the fact that throughout the year, you should be bribing the kitchen god with food and drink. And of course, after you've made your offering, lit the incense, bow to the kitchen god, after the incense is done, you know, and your wishes uh, go up to uh, the heavens or to the kitchen god, then you drink and eat. So I think this is a wonderful tradition for all of us to continue. Um, you can buy a kitchen god generally at this wonderful store in Manhattan's Chinatown called Grand Tea Imports. And they actually have a website and right now, unfortunately, they're sold out, but they hope to be having stock soon on the plaque and on the picture. Um, but as I said, the statues are very, very rare. Uh, the other thing that is very, very traditional, of course, about Chinese New Year's is to eat very specific foods that ensure your blessings for the year. And so one of the dishes that I've been cooking uh, quite a bit is this longevity noodles recipe that I actually just developed uh, for Eating Well magazine. And the meaning behind it is uh, the Chinese say that pork represents bounty. This recipe has mushrooms. Mushrooms grow very quickly. And so uh, the association is that your prosperity will bloom quickly as, as quickly as the mushrooms grow. Uh, there are scallions. The word for scallions in Chinese is tong. So um, it sounds like the word for intelligence, tongming. So when you eat uh, the scallions, you'll be uh, intelligent for the coming year. And there's cilantro, which represents compassion. So I'm just going to start this recipe uh, to show you um, how to do a very, very basic stir fry. And it's very hard for me to do a cooking demo because I'm sort of uh, locked in between the computer and my iPhone, which is set on a tripod so that you could see what's happening on the stove, but there's not enough room for me to move to a counter. So I can't show very much prep for you, but I just wanted to show a few things. And one is that when you take ginger, um, it's very typical that uh, a recipe calls for peeling it 
let me see, where is my, it's this position. Um, and I just wanted to say to you, uh, oftentimes recipes, does this look kind of blasted out? Let me just lower the light. That's a little better, isn't it? I can't tell. Anyway, um, often recipes tell you to use a paring knife or to use a vegetable peeler. But the easiest thing, the easiest way to peel ginger is to just use a um, spoon. And what I like about a spoon is that it just takes the peel. And it also fits into all the nooks and crannies. Can you just see that? It's sort of blasted out. Sorry about that. We can't see, sorry. How about this? Can you see it this way? Back up a tiny bit. Okay, so all I'm saying is you wanna peel it with a teaspoon like this. And as you can see, it just pulls off the peel and none of the flesh. And then for another thing I wanted to show you is this recipe calls for baby bok choy. This is the Shanghai baby bok choy. And what I like about it is um, it's so small that it means that you can do less prep. There's less uh, slicing. Yeah, that's less my so what I generally do is I trim off, can you see this? About uh, an eighth of an inch of the baby bok choy there. And then as you can see, all the pieces come apart quite easily. And I throw them into a salad spinner and soak it in water through several changes of water. And then the most important part is that you actually need to drain all the water and use the salad spinner and remove all the excess water. So this is a tip that most people don't give you when you're stir frying, um, but it's very important that the vegetable is dry to the touch. If it's sopping wet, when you add it to the wok, it will take down the temperature of the wok and it turns your stir fry into a soggy braise. So I literally just use a salad spinner two or three times until the baby bok choy is absolutely dry to the touch. When my mother was um, cooking, uh, when we were uh, children, she would always wash the vegetables in the morning and put them into the colander. And by the time she came home from work, the vegetables were dry because she didn't have a salad spinner. But the salad spinner is very convenient. And I want to show you this very cool tool called a negi cutter. And um, there's a wonderful store in Chinatown, Manhattan's Chinatown called KK Discount. We call it the mom and pop style Target store in Chinatown. And they have all kinds of wonderful houseware items. They have woks, they have cleavers, uh, traditional dishes. But this is a Japanese scallion cutter and it's very dangerous. It has seven very, very sharp blades. And what you can do, negi actually means scallion in Japanese. Um, what I do is, if you can see the scallion, it's a little blasted out. Let me lower the light a little bit more. Um, you can start two inches from the bottom and cut through and then turn it and do the same thing. And as you can see, it completely cuts these fine shreds. And then I just use my knife and all your friends will think you have extraordinary knife skills because look at how fine the shreds are. Can you see this? So within like one minute, you can completely cut a half a cup of uh, finely shredded scallions. And, and it's fabulous when you're steaming a, uh, a fish or something. So that's a nice way. I like all these different ways to cheat because <laughs> we don't have a lot of time when we're cooking. So we're done with all the little tips I wanted to show you. And now let's just start with the recipe. So I have a tablespoon of minced ginger. I think maybe it's easier to show to you this way. And then I have the pork here. If you don't want to use pork, you could use chicken. 
Um, you could also use, um, well, I would say chicken or pork are probably the best. Um, I cut the pork into one quarter inch uh, thick slices. I trim off any excess fat. You're not seeing that. Let me put it here. Um, and the thing that you want to uh, keep in mind whenever you're doing a stir fry <clears throat> is to cut the ingredients as uniformly as possible. Because if you have some slices that are half an inch thick and some that are quarter inch thick, by the time the half inch thick slices are uh, cooked through when you stir fry, the quarter inch thick slices are going to be overcooked. So when we marinade, I just take the pork, I'm gonna add one and a half teaspoons of cornstarch. So in a Western marinade, they always combine the marinade ingredients first and make the marinade and then pour it over the meat. But in Chinese cooking, we just add each individual component. This is a teaspoon of soy sauce and a teaspoon of rice wine or dry sherry. And I just wanted to address soy sauce. Soy sauce is a very, um, uh, it, it depends on your individual taste about which soy sauce you like. So I'm just stirring this mixture until the cornstarch is no longer visible. Um, so it's, it has to do with your individual taste, but I- hey, Grace? Have, yeah. I think if you lower your camera down towards the uh, you know, what, what you're doing, Right now, if people are on speaker view, they're only seeing you, they're not seeing your stove. That's right. Okay. Absolutely. Which camera do you want me to lower? Yeah, the, the, the other view. Yeah, the other view. Look at the yeah, camera. Yeah, there's view. a second camera. So look at the other view. The ca In the gallery. Yeah, look at the walk. I mean, look at right. from here. If pe uh, people need to then go back to gallery view in order for that, them to see that. You yeah. can keep it in speaker view. And if you click on the video where you can see Grace cooking, you can click pin. That will make it the big view. Oh, apparently the host has the ability to pin both if uh, the host wants to do that. Nina, can you do that? But her camera angle Hi. is still too high. Hello, everyone. Um, so right now I have pinned um, Grace's second camera, but it seems like I'm the only one that can see it. Um, oh. I was able, I was able to pin it myself. I just pinned it now. Yes, okay. You can. go to the three dots, the ellipsis, the three dots, tap that, and you'll see the pin possibility, I think. Yeah, I have a pin, but I, her camera angle is too high. Okay, so oh, there we go. All right, so this has been marinated. Um, and as I said, the most important thing is just that the pork is cut into as uniform slices as possible. So it's marinated, I'm gonna set this aside over here. And then I just wanna show you one more thing. And that is, so I'm using this stove as a sort of counter. This is my chili garlic sauce. And to this I'm adding a tablespoon of soy sauce and a tablespoon of rice wine or dry sherry. Oh, I was explaining soy sauce to you. So um, one of my new favorite soy sauces is Yamasa, which is a Japanese soy sauce. And um, it is less salt soy sauce. And it is naturally brewed and one tablespoon is 520 milligrams of sodium, whereas regular soy sauce is basically double that. And the flavor is really fantastic. Uh, I have tried reduced sodium Kikoman and I feel like that just tastes like chemicals, but this is really fantastic. Um, I also wanted to, so this is our sauce ingredients. It's chili garlic sauce, soy sauce, and the rice wine or dry sherry. Um, if you don't use chili garlic sauce or you don't have it, here it is. Uh, you could use sriracha and add a little bit more garlic. This calls for two teaspoons. That might be too spicy for some people, 
so you could reduce it, or it might be not spicy enough for others, so you could go to a tablespoon. All of this is very individual. Um, I've already prepped my bok choy, which is right here. And then I've already thinly sliced my mushrooms. I'm just remembering I need to add a quarter teaspoon of salt to the pork, which I forgot. So let me add that. So uh, Eating Well Magazine had me develop this recipe for the Lunar New Year. And in fact, um, they're also very sodium conscious. So I think I called for originally three quarters of a teaspoon of salt and they have reduced it to a total of one half teaspoon salt. Um, and with that, the total amount of sodium for this recipe using this less salt uh, Yamasa that I like so much is about 1,100 milligrams of sodium. So I think it's actually a very good thing for us to be very conscious of how much sodium that we're adding to our diet. So I also cooked the noodles before uh, earlier. And this is the lo mein and it's been tossed in, um, let me put it here. It's been tossed with sesame oil. And you can use uh, lo mein that you buy from the refrigerator section of most Asian supermarkets. You could also use fresh Asian, uh, fresh Italian pasta. In Little Italy, I can buy fresh spaghetti, which is really fantastic for this. Um, or you could use dry spaghetti if you're not able to find the fresh lo mein. All right, so now, Let's talk about the walk. Um, first, let me uh, discuss the spatula. Now, a lot of people always want to use a Chinese spatula, which is this tool here. And these days, I find that the, spatula, the Chinese spatulas that you can find in Chinatown are not as good as the old fashioned ones that I bought like 20, 30 years ago. They don't really fit the curve of the walk and they tend to scratch the patina from the walk. Um, so I don't really like Chinese spatulas these days unless they're the really old style ones. So I generally recommend you should use a fish spatula because that fits the curve of the walk really nicely. I also like this old fashioned pancake spatula because you can get in really nicely. And I prefer metal spatulas because they're thin and they can get in under meat, chicken, rice, noodles. A lot of people want to stir fry with a wooden spatula and I don't recommend it because um, it's much thicker than a metal spatula and you really, you'll, you're going to get more sticking in your wok because you cannot get underneath the ingredients. So here is um, my walk. I actually have many, many walks. I have uh, walks in my oven, walks in my kitchen cabinet, uh, walks under my desk, walks under my bed. I am a walkaholic. And um, my husband doesn't know how many walks there are actually. From May Leo. So um, May says that Grace. This is the walk that I prefer. It's a 14 inch flat bottom carbon steel walk. You measure the 14 inches from here to here, the edges. And it has a flat bottom, which is about like five or six inches on the bottom that's flat. And what I like about it is the traditional Chinese walk is round bottom, but that requires sitting on a walk ring. And so the moment you put it on a walk ring, the walk is too far from the heat. So whether you have a gas stove or electric ceramic glass top or induction, the flat bottom makes a lot more sense. So when you're stir frying, it's very important that you um, preheat the wok. And everyone has a different kind of stove. So it's very hard to say, I've seen recipes that say you need to preheat your wok one minute, two minutes. That's not it's not accurate because if you have a very, very powerful stove like a wolf or a Viking range, you could actually preheat your wok in like 10 seconds possibly. So I always say you should test the wok by 
um, splashing a drop of water in, and when it evaporates within one second, you're ready to go. That's not quite ready. And what I love, you can buy all kinds of walks now. You can buy stainless steel, anodized aluminum, and the horrible, horrible nonstick, which to me is not suited to um, stir frying because stir frying requires high heat and most nonstick cookware is not designed to be used on high heat. It's actually dangerous because it releases a toxic fume. So this is about ready. If you're new to stir frying, I would say you should just turn off the heat for a second and then swirl in one tablespoon of oil. And then you can turn it back on. And then I always swirl the oil around the bottom of the pan so that it completely coats the wok. And then I add the pork. And you need to hear a sizzle. If there's no, whoops, I'm so distracted. I should have added my, my ginger. Ah. So it's good to have a mistake because this is what happens sometimes. I should have added the ginger and stir fried it for a few seconds. I'm going to add it just like this. So in stir frying, I always suggest that you let the meat spread out and, and just let it sear for about one minute. Nobody in Hong Kong or China or Asia would do it, but the stoves in Asia are set at a much more powerful temperature. They're basically as strong as a wolf or a Viking range. And so this gives your um, meat a chance to sear a little bit. If you try to stir fry immediately, which is what people do when they're stir frying, like in, in Hong Kong or China, in America, since our stoves aren't powerful enough, the meat is going to go gray and foamy. And there's going to be sticking. So look at this. There's absolutely no sticking. And the pork is already browning really nicely. And then what I'm going to do is add the last tablespoon. Whoops. I'm going to add my bok choy. Whoops. And mushrooms. And stir fry this for about a minute. just until the bok choy starts to turn bright green. So the whole time you're stir frying, there needs to be a sizzle sound. If there's no sizzle sound, um, your wok wasn't correctly preheated. And if I had added sopping wet bok choy to this, it would have killed the temperature of the wok and turned the stir fry into a braise. So can you see that the bok choy is starting to wilt? And now I'm going to add that last tablespoon of oil. And finally, the noodles that have been tossed in sesame oil. And then here are the sauce ingredients. And I always drizzle them along the edge of the wok. And add a quarter of a teaspoon of salt. So I mentioned that you can buy non-stick woks, anodized aluminum, stainless steel, but the beauty of a carbon steel wok is it heats quickly. The more you cook with it, 
the more it achieves a natural nonstick finish. So it's just like cast iron. Well, it is an honor to be in your presence. You actually observe the food actually absorbs dietary iron from the carbon steel. So it's very healthy for for, for us to cook with carbon steel. And this is a great one pot meal. And that's it. So it's very simple. And finally, we add some scallions and cilantro. There you have it. So it's picture perfect. Can you see that? Yep. So um, I think I can answer questions for you right now, or possibly Jerry wants to do his raffle, and um, I can have a taste of this. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Grace. There, there, there were a couple of questions that came up uh, during the. Uh, can Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there were a couple of questions that came up during your preparation, which I, I think we'll address uh, during the Q and A. But uh, maybe what you can do you know, comment on is. The oil that you use, you know, uh, not the sesame oil, but the other oil you use, what was it and why? Yes, that's a great question. So for stir frying, you always want an oil that has a high smoking point. So that typically in Chinese cooking, that would be peanut oil, but you can also use grapeseed is really wonderful, rice bran, avocado, safflower. Um, the one oil you do not want to use is olive oh. oil especially extra virgin. And so occasionally I see people uh, write a stir fry recipe using sesame oil, and that is a huge no-no. Sesame oil, like extra virgin olive oil, has a very low smoking point. So once you preheat your wok, the moment you add sesame oil, it would start to smoke wildly, which means that you've actually broken down the chemical structure of the oil, and it's actually dangerous to eat. Thanks. My, my dad was a chef and uh, he used peanut oil for everything. Yes. And you know, one of the other things he said is that it didn't add any flavor to the dish itself. So you generally tasted the ingredients and not the oil. It's so not a good thing. All right. Well, let me do this uh, for a few minutes. Uh, we're going to conduct our first raffle. And uh, during this raffle, uh, uh, this first one, we're going to give away copies of Grace's uh, books. Uh, which will uh, generously autograph for us. Um, but um, let me show you how useful a uh, walk is. Uh, Grace has shown you what you can do with it with food. I'm going to show you what you can do with it with raffle tickets. All the raffle tickets are in my walk, my 40-year-old walk. Uh, unfortunately, as George has noted, this is not a carbon steel walk. This is a uh, before I realized you know, the, the error of my ways, but it does serve the purpose for what we're going to do right now. So I'm going to basically start pulling uh, raffle tickets. We're giving away uh, two copies of uh, The Wisdom of the Chinese Kitchen by Grace Young. So the first one, I will not look at it, is Ticket number 407712. 407712. Ah. <laughs> and I will read the name. And I have the name on the back. It's Doris Ling. Congratulations, Doris. All right. Doris Ling, you have one, one copy of this book. All right. Let me uh, shake up the tickets a little bit more. And another ticket, let's see. Oh, I took two by accident. One. 407663. 407663. Yeah! No, it's not you, George. <laughs> it's uh, Elaine Lee, I believe. Oh, no, wait, it's not. I got the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Elaine, are you, Elaine I, one. Are you, if you're out there, you know, you, you know, I, I think you are. I think I saw you log, log in. 
congratulations. You've also won a copy, an autographed copy of The Wisdom of the Chinese Kitchen from uh, Grace Young, okay? So congratulations to uh, uh, Elaine and to Doris. And let me work on the next one. The next book is Star Frying to the Sky's Edge. All right, and we will be giving away two copies of that as well. So let's keep shaking away here. And okay, ticket number 407724. 407724. Uh, okay, Lisa Kwan, congratulations, Lisa. Uh, Lisa, I think I, I know you're out there. All right, congratulations, Lisa. You have won yourself a copy of, um, uh, I gotta get the name, Stir Frying to the Sky's Edge. Thank you. All right, and okay, here we go again. And for the second copy, it'll be 407-539. 407-539. Jack Lee. Congratulations, Jack. You're out there. I think I saw you. All right. So Jack and Lisa, each of you will get an autographed copy of Sir Frying to the Sky's Edge. And the next one, The Breath of the Walk. Okay, we'll be doing away two copies of this as well. Let's keep going. And the ticket number is 407563. 407563. It's uh, Jane Aoyama. Jane Aoyama. I, I think we know you're out there, Jane, somewhere. <laughs> well, congratulations. You've won a copy of the, the book as well. And we're going to give one more copy away. Let's keep stirring. I should have used more peanut oil in here. Okay. The number is 407-744. 407-744. Dominic Tong, congratulations, Dominic. <laughs> Dominic, you're, you're a very generous man. Thank you very much. And you, you've won yourself a copy of the book as well. All right, so I will uh, conclude this first portion of the drawings with uh, these books. These books will be sent to you at, with uh, autographs from Grace herself. And then um, we're gonna have a second drawing in, later on in the program for the walks and we'll be giving away six walk sets as well. So, you know, stay tuned. And, uh, and with that, I think I'm gonna turn it back to uh, Grace again. Grace, I think you wanted to talk a little bit about Chinatown, right? Yes, yeah. So I just wanted to tell everybody a little bit about what's happening uh, or what I've observed in Manhattan's Chinatown in the last year. I understand um, most of your members are in the tri-state area, but there are also people who are outside of the New York area right now. Um, so as George said, uh, I have been a cookbook author for the last 20, 30 years. I've worked in the food industry. And as COVID started in January of 2020, I live very close to Chinatown and I'm in Chinatown almost every day. I was just completely, it was so painful to see Chinatown empty out and to see the immediate, immediate shunning of Chinatown by uh, New Yorkers and even by Chinatown locals. Um, so I started monitoring what was going on. Food and Wine Magazine asked me to write a piece. So um, I wrote a piece about how New Yorkers needed to rally to support Chinatown businesses. And in March, I was supposed to be doing uh, some auxiliary, I'm, I was supposed to be doing some cultural lectures for Poster House Museum because they had just opened uh, a Chinese exhibition. Um, and um, the, the show uh, Sleeping Giant had just opened. 
And a week later, the director, Julia Knight, contacted me and she said, all museums in New York City have been shut down and we know Chinatown is hurting. We have this Chinese exhibition. We were wondering, do you have any ideas of what we could do to help Chinatown? So Julia is this very, very extraordinary, compassionate person. I had never met her. And I said to her by phone that I had been wanting to go to Chinatown and videotape restaurant and shop owners talking about how COVID had impacted their businesses. And I thought if New Yorkers heard these stories, that it would motivate them to rally their support and show up to Chinatown. So she said, you do these interviews and we'll post them on our website. How soon can you do it? So we were speaking to each other on Friday the 13th of March. And I said, I'll do it this weekend. So the next day, um, I went to Chinatown to try and set up interviews and nobody was interested in doing interviews. And as many of you know, uh, Chinese merchants are often very private people. And one person said to me, uh, this is a very shameful time. Nobody wants to talk about business being bad. So I had one person who was willing to do an interview, Mei Chow, who at the time had a Malaysian French restaurant. And so I set out a, um, post on Instagram asking if anybody would volunteer their time as a videographer to accompany me. And this wonderful angel, Dan On, said he would do it. So on Sunday, we went down to do one interview with Mei Chow and she was upbeat. She wasn't going to reduce her hours or close her business. And then came word that uh, Hop Key Restaurant, I got a text message from a friend of mine um, and I had met the owner of Hop Key maybe uh, three or four weeks earlier when I did my food and wine article that he was willing to talk to me. So um, I ended up, we ended up going to Hop He, which has been in Chinatown since 1968. And he only gave us two minutes, but they are, this video is very, very powerful. He had tears in his eyes and he said, we're shutting today. And uh, I don't know when we're gonna reopen. And we went into the restaurant kitchen and it was silent. I've been into many, many restaurant kitchens in my life. They're always, Chinese restaurants are clamoring with the sound of walks and chopping and washing. This one was absolutely silent. The chefs, the, you know, the, uh, the assistants, you know, the dishwashers, they were all just looking at me. I came into the dining room, the waiters were all just standing around. There was maybe two people eating there. Normally there's a line out the door for hockey. Um, and I will never forget the looks on their faces. Um, we did a total of five interviews that day, four restaurants and one shop owner. And we found out that 70% of the owners were planning on closing the following day, restaurant owners, um, because business was so bad. And by that night, uh, Mayor de Blasio actually announced that all restaurants were shutting the following day. But that was one of the most painful experiences of my life. And uh, I think one of the saddest moments in Chinatown's history. Um, and we were there in the middle and we captured it and it became coronavirus Chinatown stories. And you can see these videos on the Poster House website and the Smithsonian showed them twice last year for their youth summit and also for their food history weekend. And since then I've monitored what's been going on in Chinatown. Um, at the end of March, April, May, it was a ghost town. It was like a movie set of Chinatown, empty. Uh, I feared for my own life going into Chinatown. Um, it was scary. It was really scary at that time. And uh, by June, when, when the weather warmed up and New York City reopened, there was a sense of vitality. We started outdoor dining. Um, I think by August or September, we had indoor dining at 25% capacity. Um, but all this time, all these poor businesses have been operating at 20% of what they earned pre-COVID. And yet they've all been still paying their expenses. Um, one of the businesses that I've been following is Hopley Restaurant, which is almost 50 years old. And they were, they closed in March and they were the last to reopen in October. 
and yet he was paying all of his expenses through this time. And I brought BuzzFeed in to interview him recently. And to my surprise, he actually told the BuzzFeed editor that his electricity and gas bills monthly are $6,000. His water bill is $2,000. So that's $8,000 right there. He said, garbage and insurance, I must pay. These five items, he said, I have to pay on time or they will shut me down. And if Con Edison shuts my gas, it might not be restored for one year. So I said to him, I thought rent was your, uh, you know, your biggest responsibility. And he looked at me like I was crazy. And he said, rent is only one third of my headache. So these poor guys have been struggling for over a year. Um, most of them are still operating, as I said, at 20 to 30% of what they were earning before. So anyone who's still open right now is hanging by a thread. We had 300 Chinese restaurants pre-COVID. We now have 200. We have lost legacy restaurants like WK that was here for 65 years. We lost Hop Sing over 50 years, Long Moon Bakery over 50 years. Um, Meili Produce Market over 40 years. And to me, these are the heart and soul of Chinatown. This is what gives Chinatown the great character. And um, it's, it's, the, it's the foundation of the community. And so I've been so concerned that we could lose Hop Lee, Hop Key, Wo Hop, upstairs, downstairs. Those are our oldest restaurants. There's also Namwa. But Namwa is gets all the publicity. It's the oldest restaurant. It's 100 years old. He just came out with a cookbook this year. So the other four restaurants don't get as much media attention or get no media attention. And so I started this fundraiser, Support Chinatown. And as George said, the concept is to raise money to give it to these restaurants so that they can feed those who are in need in the community. Um, if you want to contribute to this fund, all you have to do is just Google GoFundMe and then my name, Grace Young. And uh, as George said, we were hoping to raise $20,000 and we've raised $34,000, which means that we can provide 3,400 meals. And that means that each restaurant um, can get a little extra money. Um, but it, it won't even pay their gas and electricity for one month, what they're gonna get. Um, and I want to thank so much uh, this group, the Asian alumni group, because you're allowing me to give my stipend for this event tonight to Hopley Restaurant. And uh, yeah, I just worry so much for all these businesses. It's just heartbreaking. And sometimes I go into Chinatown at like 4.30 in the evening and now in the winter months when it's really cold, especially when I walk on, Ma on Mulberry Street from Canal to Bayard, there must be at least six or seven businesses that have shut. So the, the street is so quiet. Just last week, a few days ago, I found out that the hair salon on the street is closed. So that street has, has suffered so much. They lost PS23 from, to the fire. They've lost now this hair salon. They lost uh, the supermarket. They lost Lung Moon Bakery. Um, there's a Vietnamese restaurant that they lost. So it's just so quiet and so painful. Um, and I think these winter months are really scary because in the old days, on a cold winter day, you would still have tourists, jury duty customers, court people, lower Manhattan workers, and university students. And now all of them have evaporated. And even locals are afraid to go down because of the Asian anti-Asian hate crimes. So sometimes when I've gone into Chinatown, it is a ghost town. Um, I started this uh, campaign with the James Beard Foundation, Save Chinese Restaurants. It's very simple. All you have to do is post a photograph of your favorite Chinese dish and use the hashtag Save Chinese Restaurants and post it on Instagram from your local Chinese restaurant. 
because it's not just Manhattan's Chinese, Manhattan's Chinatown that's suffering. It's San Francisco, it's Boston, it's Chicago. It's all those little mom and pop Chinese restaurants all over this country. And last March, it was reported that 59% of independently owned Chinese mom and pop restaurants had ceased their credit card and debit card transactions, implying that they had permanently closed. And at the same time, P.F. Chang's got five to $10 million in PPP loans and last March announced that their, um, their sales had doubled. So my fear is the future is when we want Chinese food, we're gonna to have to go to P.F. Chang's or Panda Express. Or if we let these businesses in Chinatown fail, we're gonna get a Trader Joe's on Mott Street or on Grant Avenue. So um, that's my spiel. I think these next couple of weeks are really critical wherever you are. Please support your local Chinese businesses. They're all hanging by a thread. We need to help them through this, the cold weather, and then hopefully more and more people are vaccinated. The weather warms up. There can be more indoor dining and they can um, rise back on their feet, but they need our help. So thank you so much for inviting me to be a speaker. And uh, I wish you all a very blessed and uh, a year of good fortune for the year of the ox. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Hey, uh, I just wanted to reiterate, uh, Grace has been very generous and she's actually donated her normal speaker's fee to help Hop Lee. Um, Hop Lee's received their check from uh, the Alumni Association and uh, we're actually planning on doing a little bit of a, a publicity photo op with them in the next coming several weeks. Uh, we've created a gigantic uh, uh, lottery winners type check and we'll present it to folks at Hop Lee and hopefully uh, we'll get some uh, media attention and uh, some focus on the problems of Chinatown help, res help resolve some of them. All right so again thank you Grace appreciate that and uh, we're going to open up now to questions and answers so uh, folks that uh, have questions uh, about anything that we've discussed or you know, uh, need immigration help uh, George is still pretty capable in that area as a former judge, but uh, let's uh, try to answer some of your questions. Uh, I'll start off by saying one of the questions that came up, Grace, was how do you season a new walk? What are the steps that are involved? Uh, it's very simple. So you want to scrub the, the a brand new carbon steel walk will look like a stainless steel pan. Um, and you want to scrub it with this stainless steel scrubber um, with liquid uh, dishwashing soap inside and out several times, hot water. You're not gonna understand why I'm saying that it has to be scrubbed as hard as possible, but when you rinse out the hot water and set it on the stove and turn on the heat, there's bound to be a little bit of a chemical smell because every pan is coated on the inside and outside with a factory coating. And that's to protect it from rusting before you buy it. So that's why you scrub it with uh, liquid detergent and this scrubber, and then you just heat it and then add two tablespoons of a high smoking point oil. And then traditionally the Chinese would stir fry Chinese chives, but you could also stir fry a bunch of scallions that have been cut into two inch pieces and a half a cup of ginger. Or if you don't have that, you could take a yellow onion that's been sliced up. And then you just reduce the temperature to medium and stir fry the mixture um, for 20 minutes. And as it softens up, you actually take your spatula and smear the onion mixture or the chive mixture along the edges of the wok. And what's happening is the heat opens up the, the pores of the metal and you're literally coating the pores with the vegetable oil and sealing it from rust. And then each time you cook with the wok, you're actually layering on, you're burning in that cooking oil and creating that natural nonstick surface. Great. You know, speaking of walks, uh, Grace, I, I understand that one of your walks is in the Smithsonian. Is that true? Can you tell us about that? Yes, it's on its way to the Smithsonian. It's my parents' walk when they first got married. Uh -huh. and, um, it's about 70 years old now. And when I started writing Wisdom of the Chinese Kitchen, I had only seen my parents cook out of 
barberware and uh, revereware pots and skillets. I'd never seen them use a wok. And so I said to them, why don't you use a wok? And at the time, my mother was in her 70s and my father was in his 80s. And they said, oh, you know, when we moved into this house, there was an electric stove. You can't use a round bottom wok on an electric stove. So we never used a wok. And in 2009, my father died. And then when I was home in San Francisco, my brother came home with a Safeway shopping bag and said, oh, I thought you would want this. And he hands it to me and it's my parents' walk. And unbeknownst to me, they had used a walk in their first home for at least seven years when they had a gas stove. And this walk had this thick patina like a restaurant walk. And how did, how did my brother have it? He went away to college and he took it thinking he would use it, but he forgot about it and he stuck it in the corner of his closet. So he came across it, knew my interests. So I think that this is what's happened to walk traditions in America. So many Chinese Americans no longer use a walk. And so I said to the Smithsonian, this walk tells an important story that the walk is actually an endangered culinary tool at this point. We've had the walk for over 2000 years, but in China and in America, there are so many Chinese people who have no idea how to use a traditional walk. They're using nonstick, which is dangerous and not suited for walk cooking, um, for high heat cooking. And so the Smithsonian agreed <coughs> so they have taken the walk. Oh, Grace, that's great. We're, uh... Where, where, would we, where are we going to find it in the Smithsonian? What section would they put it in? Um, I, it, I think it's, it, it might be en route to the Smithsonian because yeah. it was exhibited at the Museum of Food and Drink in Brooklyn. And because of COVID, it missed the boat of being shipped to the Smithsonian when it was supposed to be. So I'm right. not sure where it is right now. Uh, Probably next to Julia Child's kitchen. Yeah, I think <laughs> that. All right. Okay, folks, if you have questions, you know, please feel free to you know, speak up and uh, you know, Nina can open up uh, you know, your audio and you can ask the question yourself, but uh, let her know through chat that you have a question. So uh, feel free to fire away. And uh, by the way, um, while people are thinking up their questions, uh, for the next raffle, uh, we'll be giving away a raffle uh, set. So I've moved the raffle tickets to another walk that is more deserving of that selection, my larger walk. As Grace says, you can never have enough walks and uh, we have uh, at least three or four handles. So uh, we'll get to the drawing in a couple of minutes, but um, let's see if there are any further questions there. Anybody? Jack? Yes. Hi. Thank you, Grace, for uh, this very important information. Uh, I, my question is about Chinatown. Uh, did you say 55, 59 percent of the restaurants have closed? No, in, in Manhattan's Chinatown, we've lost roughly a hundred restaurants. Okay. We had three hundred. We're now down to two hundred. But I said nationwide, as of last March, uh, the news media reported that fifty-nine percent of independently owned Chinese restaurants across the country had closed. And at the time, they also reported that we had lost 233,000 Asian American small businesses. Now, did, did, were they able to get some of the PPP uh, that government was offering? Uh, I'm just questioning how come they weren't able to get some of that money to help? Um, I, I don't know. I, you know. I'm a cookbook author and all the work I've been doing at Chinatown, they called me the accidental Chinatown advocate. So I can't really explain what happened with PPP. I can tell you that there was a special loan that was created in New York City for a low to middle income minority neighborhoods in November. And uh, in the copy, uh, it actually said that it's targeted for neighborhoods like Harlem and Chinatown and Bensonhurst. And yet they, uh, the execution of this loan was by zip code and they omitted 113, which is Chinatown Prime. It's Mott Street, Elizabeth, Mulberry, Doyers, Pell, could not apply for this loan. So uh, they were immediately told that there was this ridiculous zip code error, and they did nothing for like three months. And welcome to Chinatown. 
is the organization that I partnered with to create this GoFundMe to raise money for Chinatown. And they were uh, constantly posting on Instagram and I think even talking to the SBS. Um, so I think something happened, but I'm not sure. I haven't kept up with that. Thank you. Hey, Grace, uh, we have another, another question. Uh, how, often, how do you wash a walk and how often should you? Sure. Uh, you should wash your walk every time you use it. I use hot water. I wash it the same way most people wash a cast iron skillet. So there are two schools of thinking on how to wash a walk. Um, some people say it should just be hot water and no liquid detergent. And some people say they use liquid detergent. So uh, the people who say don't use uh, liquid detergent say that the detergent actually uh, leaves an aftertaste or makes your walk stick the next time. I've never found that. I'm a purist. I, I believe in just hot water and an old fashioned Chinese, um, uh, what, are these, spon what are these called? Um, Scotch Bright sponges. So I normally use the yellow side. <laughs> um, but the moment I cook my dish, I normally let the wok cool maybe one or two minutes and then I fill it with hot water. You don't want to put in water immediately because that can actually shock the pan if the water is cold and you could create like a little, um, what is it? It can warp the pan. So after it's cooked in hot water and I use the yellow side of the sponge, if there's still anything that's sticking, I use the uh, rough green side and just gently remove any food debris uh, when you go to Chinatown, you can often buy those, see and buy those bamboo scrubbers that are meant for cleaning a walk. Um, I would never ever use that because that's only intended for restaurant use. If you have a home walk, your patina is very delicate. And if you use that rough bamboo scrubber, you would scratch the patina right out of your walk. So when you're cooking in a restaurant situation, you cook 300 dishes a day in a walk, if not more. So, at, so that patina on a restaurant walk is so thick. Whereas walks at home, maybe you cook 300 dishes in a year. So if you use that bamboo scrubber, you're just gonna destroy your walk's patina. And I did this video called Walk Therapist, which you can find on YouTube. And it's sort of uh, comedic and uh, I'm very proud of it because it, it discusses all the usual phobias and anxieties that people experience when they start using a traditional walk. And um, last year in the middle of COVID, that was a high point that uh, the video won a James Beard Award. So it's really fun. Thanks, Grace. You can find the links on, on Grace's website, graceyoung.com. GraceYoung.com. Okay, great. Okay, um, uh, I think what we'll do is uh, proceed to the second drawing to for, uh, for, uh, the walk sets, okay? And I'll proceed <laughs> that by saying uh, the winners of the walk sets are going to have some options. So what we will do is get in contact with the winners and discuss those options with them. There are lots of different things that Grace has uh, hinted at and brought up as far as you know, the type of stove you have and so on that may influence the usefulness of a particular walk. And we want to make sure that whatever you select as a prize makes sense for your particular situation, okay? So let me uh, take up my walk here again. And this one is ticket number 407-594. Four zero seven five nine four. David Chu. David Chu, are you out there? I don't know if David is. All right, some of us know David, and I'm sure you know he'll he'll use this walk well. All right, congratulations, David. All right, we've got five more to go, folks. So hang in there. All right, let's see. Four zero seven seven two three four zero seven seven two three. 
Lisa Kwan again. Lisa, a double winner. She she's a double winner. She's won a cookbook, and now she can actually cook what she reads in yes. her own book. Congratulations, Lisa. Thanks. <clears throat> Lisa, are you out there? <laughs> yes. Hello. Hey, congratulations. Hi. Hi. <laughs> All right. Well, make, make, make some good dishes, okay? Right, Buy a lottery ticket tonight. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm just, uh, let's see. I'm trying to grab this one here. Oh boy, this is amazing. <laughs> 407 743. 407 743. Dominic Tong again. Oh, double winner. Where are you? <laughs> so, so, Dominic, we're getting double winners here, folks. That Dominic has won a, a cookbook and he's also won a walk set. So, we'll, congratulations, Dominic. We'll talk to you about which one is appropriate, okay? Dominic, I see you there. There you are. <laughs> Okay, so what do we got here? We've got uh, one, two, three. I've got three more to go. Okay, ticket number 407650. 407650. Yvonne Chong. Yvonne, are you out there? Yvonne, is that you over there? <laughs> hey, congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Lisa's my cousin. Uh, what's that? Lisa Kwan is my cousin. Oh, wait a second. <laughs> how, how are we doing this? My family's? <laughs> well, congratulations, okay? I'm Thank glad you. Both, glad you and Lisa both won, okay. Now I'll All have right. to borrow her cookbook. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. All right, we've got a few more to go here. Okay. Okay, this one isn't going to be interesting. This is 407691. 407691. And this is Professor Chang, who is the faculty advisor for the Asian Alumni Group. Professor Chang, are you out there? I can't see you in, in, in too many people, but. Uh, I donated to the next winner. <laughs> I yeah, so, to the next winner. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I'll, I'll just say Professor Chang has been very generous. He's purchased a large number of raffle tickets, but he's uh, generously agreed that he will not accept the prize and give it to the next winner, okay? So uh, thank you, Professor Chang. I'll, I'll pick out another uh, you know, ticket at this point. Your generosity is appreciated. <laughs> I'm trying to just get one here. All right, ticket number 407701. 407701. Professor Chang again? <laughs> All right, we'll go up another one. <laughs> Professor Chang, you bought so many tickets. <laughs> All right. It's 407-679-407-679. I, I need to see somebody jumping up in joy. All right, Deborah Wong, where are you, Debbie? I'm here. Yay! Hey, thank you. <laughs> Congratulations. All right, Debbie. Uh, I'm sure you and Jack can use another walk. Oh, <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, folks. We have I'm, I've lost the picture here a little bit. Are you guys seeing anything? Uh, Hello. Lawrence Hello. started accidentally sharing his screen. Can we ask uh, Lawrence Goldhurst, can you please stop sharing your screen? Lauren, are you? Lawrence. Lauren, are you sharing your screen? Lawrence Goldhirsch appears to be sharing his screen. Lawrence Goldhirsch, where are you? Hey, Nina, can you uh, do something about that? I don't know how to stop. I, I don't know how to uh, <laughs> apologize. Uh, all right. Um, 
Go to the, you see a share button there, Lawrence? No, I don't have that. I'll just leave and let you go along. <laughs> All right. right fine. Uh, Lawrence, wait, wait. Right there at the top or the bottom, you should see a, a button that says stop sharing screen. I'm checking three more, two more. So somewhere at the top or bottom, you'll see. To win a second one, but then I'm going to say. Oh, okay. Give it to somebody. Your button that says stop sharing screen, probably at the bottom. <clears throat> I stop video. Is that all right? No, stop sharing screen. Okay. All right, now we're back. Right. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. All right, guys. I, I, we have one more to go here, so just uh, hang in there. Hey, George, if you win, I don't know what I'm going to do. All right, the winning number is 407-673, 407-673. May Ling, May, are you there? May? Yes, oh. thank you. Thank hey, you. Congratulations, yeah. May. You won you. yourself a, a, a walk set. So as I said, you know, with the walks, we'll, we'll be in contact with you and, you know, sort of determine exactly which one makes sense for you. All right. So, um, you know, just make sure that uh, you've provided your you know, email and telephone numbers to Nina. If you haven't, I assume that you did when you, you know, registered, but we'll, we'll be in contact with you within the next couple of days just to make sure we get you the right items, okay? So congratulations uh, for all, to all the winners. All right, um, we, we've gone over time, but I just wanted to uh, basically, uh, you know, just hand it over to Grace for one, the last moment to have her uh, give us any closing comments or, I, or thoughts, uh, Grace, uh, you know, go right ahead and let us know. Uh, well, I just wanted to thank all of you for uh, joining me this evening. And uh, uh, thanks. I'm, I'm going to presume that all of you are going to be so motivated to go out to your local Chinese restaurants and markets and Asian American small businesses and support them. And they, they really need us right now. Um, so thanks in advance for being uh, friends to the Asian American community and uh, wishing everyone a blessed year of the Ox. Okay, thank you, Grace. Thank you for uh, helping uh, us uh, with your presentation and informing us about all these things. It's been a you know a fun night. Uh, I also want to thank all uh, George for uh, 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 getting us connected with Grace. So thank you, George, and uh, thank you for all of you who uh, attended. Thank you all of you who purchased the uh, raffle tickets to support our Asian Student uh, Scholarship Fund. It's well appreciated. And uh, as you're aware, we, we normally have a uh, in-person uh, annual Lunar New Year dinner in Chinatown. And we have somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 or more people attend. Uh, we had our last uh, dinner back in February 2020, right before the shutdown. So we were able to squeeze in uh, that before uh, you know, everything got uh, you know, difficult. So this year we, uh, we, we weren't able to, 2021, we weren't able to have the Lunar New Year dinner in person, obviously, for obvious reasons. But uh, we're planning on a a uh, virtual event to celebrate Asian Heritage Month, this, uh, which is coming up in May. So um, uh, we don't have all the details in place on that yet, but I hope that uh, when we do, we'll uh, send them out to you and we hope that you'll participate in that as well. And um, you know, if uh, uh, you're looking for more information in the meantime, you know, get, look, up, look up the City College of New York Asian, uh, Asian Alumni Group or the Alumni Association. I think that you'll be able to learn a lot about what's going on, what our mission is and so forth. And uh, you don't have to be a CCNY alumni to, alumnus to uh, join. Uh, you can, uh, if you're interested in what's going on with Asian American culture, uh, interest in situations and the day-to-day -day comings and goings that affect uh, people here, you know, please, by all means, you know, look up uh, the, the site and uh, see if you'd like to join. So, as I said, it's um, been a tough on the, uh, the restaurants in Chinatown, as you've heard from Grace. I think that uh, you know, if you are near Chinatown, try to send business their way. And even if you're not anywhere near New York Chinatown, 
at least uh, send business to your local Chinese takeout, your local Chinese restaurants. You know, they're, they're small businesses and they need your help too. So uh, that would be you know, greatly appreciated. And um, if, uh, if you can, you know, also take care of yourselves, be safe. You know, can, uh, you know, Grace mentioned the, a 70 year old walk. Well, some of us are walking 70 year old walks around here. So we're, we're about that old. So uh, uh, those of us who have had our vaccines, we should feel safer. I hope that everybody will partake of that opportunity and uh, get vaccinated. Uh, even after, please wear your mask, please social distance and try to stay safe. Okay, folks. So again, thank you all very much for participating tonight. Uh, by the way, I think I mentioned on the chat, but I will be sending out a copy of Grace's longevity noodle recipe to everybody. So uh, I saw a few people scribbling away trying to take uh, copious notes. No need, you know, we'll send you the recipe and uh, you can uh, make it on your own, okay? All right, folks, so again, thank you very much and uh, have a great